Matthew chapter number 20, and uh, we, I don't know if you have, uh, I guess the more I've thought through some of this, and uh, there are a lot of people who battle exactly what we are uh, dealing with today. And I think a lot of the, or, or have been dealing with in this particular series, I think that the, the information that is uh, really contained here is uh, extremely relevant for us and uh, extremely important for us. Matthew chapter number 20, and we want to continue on with the fifth principle that we have seen, and that principle is this, avoid the pitfall of comparison. And uh, when we fall into this trap, we fall into uh, a pretty big trap. Uh, I, I think sometimes people are well-intentioned and they, they want to try to relate to other people, and so they'll start saying uh, things like, oh yeah, I understand, I can relate to that. We've talked about this before. Uh, you open up, when you make those kinds of statements, you open up a, a pretty big pitfall that I think you need to be very careful about saying those kinds of things. Maybe you've had a similar experience, but even then you probably really don't know what it's like. You really don't know what they are thinking. Take, for example, the loss of a parent. Some of you in here have lost a parent. I have not. I have experienced the loss of loved ones. I have experienced death and so forth. But let's take two individuals, both of whom lose their father. Can the one say, I know exactly what you're going through to the other one? No. He can say it, but he does not understand it. The statement is a sincere statement. But... From the one person who's saying, I understand exactly what you're going through, what happens to the person who's hearing it? Okay, it may invalidate his feelings. Normally, what comes up inside of him is what? A rage, a thought of, no, you don't understand. Or a thought of, you ain't got a clue right? A comparison that maybe had good intentions. Did it end with favorable results? No, it did not. Be careful in your desire to minister to people that you avoid the same pitfall. There are differing de Degrees of all sorts of things. Let's take another example. Two individuals have cancer. Cancer is such a broad spectrum of things today. To say even if a person had the exact same type of cancer, it still affects different individuals differently. So for us to sit here and say, well, I understand that, oftentimes creates these kinds of problems. It results, in my opinion, in a much dam more damaging sentiment on the behalf of the person who is hearing it. Uh, the last thing that I generally want to hear is, are those types of, of statements, because for me personally, and I think you probably will attest to this, um, there's a, a sense of, uh, you, you no, know, you don't understand. You don't understand how I feel. You don't understand what I'm experiencing. You don't understand my emotions in the matter. You don't understand these aspects of it. You simply don't understand. Now, I, in the flip side of it, don't understand how it affected you. Okay, so I can't come and say the exact same thing. You know, we can sympathize with, but we, all, we can't always try to compare ourselves and relate ourselves to certain situations to try to make ourselves seem more relevant. We might have something to a much greater degree. Uh, you have probably, I think now, by now, passed basic math of one plus one equals two. It is amazing how many young children understand or struggle with those concepts of 1 plus 1 and 2 plus 2 and a 3 plus 3 and 4 plus 4. Adults look at that today and they say, well, this is easy. I don't understand what the problem is. Well, when you begin to understand 
There's different levels here of things that are going on. My point in it is only to say this. You have to avoid this pitfall of comparison. Now, Matthew chapter 20 is where we're going to spend much of our time this morning. And uh, Jesus is going to give us a parable of, uh, of an individual who's going to go out and hire certain individuals to work in his vineyard. But to understand Matthew 20, you need to understand it in light of the events of Matthew chapter number 19, specifically the question that is asked by Peter in Matthew chapter 19, notice verse number 27. Peter is here, and, and uh, Peter, by the way, and if you were to, to even go back further, and I, I don't have the uh, the time to do this, but uh, there was an individual who came to him and said, well, I, I, what am I going to do to inherit eternal life? And he said, okay, well, uh, do all of these things, keep these commands. He said, well, I've kept all these things from my youth. And he said, okay, well, this is what you haven't done. Go and sell everything that you've got. Well, what happened with that man, do you remember? He left. He was gone. Went away very sorrowful. Why? Because he owned a bunch. <laughs> Uh, boy, we, we can read that and think through that, but I'll tell you what, I think we'd probably find many of the same challenges to us today, Ma or Nathan. Could be, yeah, we don't know who it is, it could certainly be, but nonetheless, so uh, they go on and, and Jesus says, well, it's harder for a rich man to enter uh, the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Does that mean then that a rich person can be saved or can't be saved? Well, that's not at all what's being taught, but the basic premise is this. They have a tendency to rely on themselves. They have been self-sufficient, and that is their natural human tendency. Well, all of this kind of sticks in Peter's mind. Here's a man who was told, go and sell everything that you've got. And Peter asked, well, who's going to be able to be saved? Well, then Peter draws attention, and he says in verse number 27, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? <laughs> Understand the essence of this question. Here's Peter, says to the Lord, Lord, I have done all of this. Lord, we have we forsaken everything. And had they forsaken everything? Yes, they really had. You go back and read in the early accounts of when they were uh, called to be the disciples. They really did forsake everything. We have forsaken everything, and, and we followed you, Lord. So what kind of a reward are we going to get? Hmm. Interesting, is it not? I see the wheels turning already in your own minds. Lord, we are engaged in all of this service. Look at everything that I've done, Lord. What? What's in it for me? Well, if you, he kind of addresses this, but in illustrating his truth, he teaches this parable in Matthew chapter number 20. Now, he says in verse number 28, and here's the immediate answer. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration... When the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve tribes, or twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone, not just you, Peter, and disciples, everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. So is God saying, men, you need to divorce your wives so that God can reward you? No. Man, you, uh, parents, you need to leave your children so that God can bless you? No, that's not at all what's being stated. But when God is truly given the first priority in a person's life, there won't be a thing you won't be willing to give up. Uh, those in that list of verse 29 are things that every person holds very dear to himself. Relationships, even possessions, not in, a, not in an improper way, but I like my house. You probably do as well. Well, not mine, yours, okay? 
Why? Because you, you're, you are in the process of purchasing it. Some of you have perhaps been fortunate enough to have already purchased it. Uh, we just got the disclosure statement from bb and as to how much we owe. And it's like, good night, I've been paying on this thing for a long time. I still owe this much? you got to be kidding me. Uh, for sure, I was down to $100 this time. And, uh, you know, it's like, and then my wife, well, it's a whole lot better than what we used to have. And I was like, good grief. Do you ever make dents in these loans? I don't know. Uh, I guess you do, but it sure is a long time. But those are things that you hold to be precious and, and close to you. And God says, you know what? The person who's willing to sacrifice these things for me will be blessed. Have you ever known a person who put God first in his life to regret it? Have you ever known a person who put God first in his life to not be blessed abundantly. If you and I were to look at our own lives, and I think we probably all would sit here and shake our heads at what we haven't done right and what we haven't done for Christ, but is it not fair to say that at least for the most part in here, if not exclusively, we've tried to honor the Lord with our lives? We had not been perfect, <laughs> but my has God blessed us. You look at that, to say, God will bless a hundredfold. He has blessed me in ways I just never would have imagined. Amen. And uh, we're thankful for those things. But verse 30, he reminds them, many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Uh, kind of an interesting thing, the way we gauge things and the way God judges things and the way God gauges things. And to illustrate that, then he gets into Matthew 20. So here's what happens. Verse number one, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So here's a man who is uh, illustrating uh, or is a, an individual who owns this house and he is needing laborers to accomplish the tasks in his vineyard. And so he goes out early in the morning and he finds some laborers and he agreed with them for, the Bible says, a penny a day. Some of you think, oh, wow, that's the same wage I make today. Uh, but nonetheless, the uh, term penny here is actually the uh, term denarius. It would be the average daily pay, okay? Uh, so now, it is to me kind of interesting, and, and uh, some have made note, and I, I would tend to have to agree with what it is that's being stated, of the word agreed. Uh, in this first particular group, it sounds more like they had to come to terms before they were ever willing to go out into the, this field. And I think there is probably a lot to be said about that. I, I think that this first group is more the mindset of Peter. Well, okay, you know, you need this. Well, what's in it for me? Yeah, I'll go work in your vineyard, but, but what's in this for me? Well, I'll pay you. Did they uh, bargain and negotiate? We don't know the answer to that. Uh, but at some point in time, the owner of the vineyard said, I'll pay you a, a penny. I'll pay you the average daily wage. And they agreed to those terms. Well, so then he goes out and, and uh, at the third hour of the day, verse number three, he went out about the third hour, this would be nine o'clock in the morning, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Here are people who are, are doing absolutely nothing. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Was there any kind of negotiation here? No. I'll pay you whatever's fair. I don't know if you've ever done work like that or not. Uh, I did a couple of times, and sometimes I concluded, <laughs> uh, all right, I'm glad you think that was fair. My idea of fair and your idea of fair are two totally different ideas of fair. Uh, thanks, it's been fun. We're not going to do that again. And, uh, but nonetheless, um, I agreed to work and be paid at the end of it, whatever they thought was fair. <laughs> we definitely had differing ideas of fairness. But nonetheless, you certainly find a lot to be commended about these individuals who are willing to just simply go on really kind of blind faith. Well then, verse number five, he went out about the sixth hour. 
as well as the ninth hour. Now we're at noon and three o'clock, and he did likewise, did the exact same thing, implying more went out at 12 and at 3. And about the 11th hour, 5 o'clock, he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? Excellent question. What are you doing? What are you doing standing here doing nothing? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. My thoughts are, where were they at 6 o'clock in the morning? Where were they at noon? Where were they at three? Did they show up for work at four o'clock and then were shocked that nobody would hire him? Go figure. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a little bit of initiative in life. But nonetheless, he goes on. He says, well, um, he saith unto them, well, go ye also into the vineyard. And again, whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. The first group, there seems to be a little bit of an agreement, a little bit of a negotiation going on. The second uh, group, the third group, uh, and even this fourth group, all the way up until five o'clock, uh, they say, well, I want you to go out to this vineyard. Now, a lot of individuals will point to this and they'll talk about being saved at the 11th hour and, and so forth. And, and is it possible for a person to be saved on his deathbed? Yeah, absolutely it is. If I were you, I wouldn't want to wait that long. You may not have a very long deathbed, okay? And uh, things can change suddenly. I just had an individual um, that I was aware of that uh, after a volleyball match, an assistant coach uh, left and got in head-on collision and should have died from it, did not. Um, but, I mean, her life, very young, young girl, was, has very severely changed all of a sudden. And, uh, I mean, these things happen unexpectedly. You don't know when that 11th hour is, so don't say, well, I'm just going to wait till the 11th hour. But nonetheless, eventually the time comes, and the even was come. Verse 8, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, call the laborers and give them their hire beginning, notice, from the last unto the first. You remember how chapter 19 ended? The last shall be first and the first shall be last. So now he's illustrating this. All right, so I want you to go and I want you to start at the person that I hired at five o'clock and, and we're just going to work our way all the way back to the person at six o'clock. And so uh, when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they received a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. Now, if you were in this situation, the wages are being paid, you see, well, here's this person who comes in at five o'clock and he's given the same amount of wage that I just agreed to. Uh, then I must be going to get more. The three o'clock, the noon, the nine, and the six. And you get there to collect your wage, and there is the exact same amount. Now, you can be assured that those who are hired at six o'clock were not at all happy with the master who hired others at five o'clock. Where did the problem all begin? Well, the problem began when they felt they were worth more. Notice the Bible says in um, verse number, let's see, verse number 10, when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. Huh. You remember Peter's question? Lord, we've forsaken everything and followed you, so, so what's in this for us? Lord, look at the amount of time that I've been doing this. Surely there's going to be a, a great reward for me. And Peter is, I'm sure, quite rebuked by this. But here come these individuals who feel that they are worth more. What's the problem? Well, they have an overinflated view of their self-worth. Let me tell you that whenever we have those kinds of problems or that kind of an attitude, when you begin to feel that you are worth more, and let me just remind you that problems are going to be inevitable. Amen. Now, have a biblical self-esteem. 
There are the individuals who can't pick their head up because they have such a low self-esteem of themselves. That's not right. Then there are individuals whose head never bows down uh, because they are that arrogant uh, and pompous. Their noses scrape the ceiling as they walk down the hallway. Uh, those individuals likewise are wrong. But when we understand God loves us to the point that he sent his only son to die for us, that gives us a pretty good view of how God feels about us. But when you begin feeling that your service is worth more than someone else's service, you are going to have a problem. Because what you're going to find is you will soon be discouraged at what you're doing. Well, Lord, I'm worth more than this. If it weren't for me, Morgan and Baptist Church would collapse. No. Same thing is true for you. This church does not exist because of me. It does not exist because of you. It exists because of what God's done in our hearts. And it is a work that God is doing. Uh, man can leave. God can continue his work right on with or without us. And so this idea that, well, I'm worth more or, or Lord, look at the sacrifices that I've made in comparison to what so-and-so's made. I'm up here every day. I'm preparing this many messages and they hadn't done anything in five years, 10 years, 20 years. Look at me, Lord. How many Peters are there in our churches today? Lord, look at everything I'm doing. Huh. How many times have we had this kind of a view that says I'm worth more than someone else? You remember the rebuke in 1 Corinthians 12 with a body? Are there parts of the body that you're able to just sit there and say, you know what? Since I'm not you, I don't have need of you? No, but sometimes it's exactly how we treat people. Well, the attitude began this pitfall of an unwise comparison. Now notice what happens. Notice how negative the attitude gets. <laughs> when you engage in this kind of comparison, you will get grumpy. Okay? Okay. I'm just telling you, you, it's going to put you in a bad mood. You ever compared your workload with the workload of someone else? How encouraging is that? Okay. You ever sat there and compared your wages with the wages of someone else? I, I know uh, recently my wife was engaged in uh, helping somebody do some things. And, and uh, there were other individuals who were sitting idly by and, and made the comment, well, well, you must be pretty well off financially, because she was able to take the time to volunteer to do something. I was like, really? <laughs> well, you got such and such, you got an iPhone. Like, this is not an iPhone, okay? And the list goes on and on and on. Now, my first thoughts when she was telling me this story was, uh, if they're volunteering doing the exact same thing you're doing, would that not say they must equally be as well off? Uh, but nonetheless, that line of argument, uh, line of logic evidently didn't sink through. But, but you know, you, this, to them, well, well, you must be financially well off. Oh, yeah, we're rolling in it. We, we've got so much money. I, I don't even use sheets in my bed. Uh, all I do is I just lay $1 bills down and I just cover up in it. I got so much money. I don't know what to do with it. You know, it's like, really? I mean, you try to you begin comparing your life with someone else. It is not going to result in a positive attitude. Notice what happens. This attitude immediately turns to grumbling and complaining. I'm worth more. And this master didn't see it. It's exactly what happens. Notice verse number 11. When they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house. They complained, saying, These last have wrought or worked but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. We have worked much harder than they have. How could you give them the same thing that you've given us? Grumbling spirit. 
You know what a grumbling spirit accuses God of not being good enough? You know, when we complain, and I know we'll often sit in a service, and if I ask the question, has God been good to us? I think every one of us in here would genuinely say, yes, he has been. Um, but when I start to complain, and I've said this a number of times, I want you to think about this statement. God, you've been good to me, but you haven't been good enough to me. Or you've been better to so-and-so. Now, if that doesn't make you feel pretty low in this world, I don't know what does. You want to bring things right back into perspective. Those kinds of lessons right here will do that. Uh, Lord, you've treated so-and-so with greater favor than you have me. Why? Because they've got a bigger house. They've got a newer car. They've got higher wages. They've got more hours. They've got better trips in my line of work. <laughs> uh, they've, got, they, they've got it made. Okay? We see things through very tainted lenses as though they don't have a problem in this life and woe is me because of all of the problems that I've got. Lord, this is not fair. Nathan? Uh, we, we do, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Paul and Sarah Crow, when they got their trailer uh, as an evangelist, you know, they were very concerned about how churches would, would view that. And some may think, well, I just can't believe someone would have a problem with it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, it, it's something. Now, um, you know, it is what it is. And, and, and we've got to be very careful. Man, it sure must be nice, you know. Well, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do this. And, and uh, my dad taught me uh, years ago, and he had some men in his, one of his churches, that, and he got a, a new car, quote unquote, an old brown Toyota Corolla, 1970 something, probably 78, 79 in the time, and a little four door. And uh, must be nice. He heard that statement. Dad looked at him and said, It is. <laughs> and uh, that was the end of that. Who are we to? To go through those things. You know how much we do this? And let me ask you, do you know how miserable we make ourselves by engaging in this kind of behavior? Yeah. It doesn't result in good things. It does not prompt you, you know what, that is so great, I'm going to go in and work harder. I'm so thankful that person's making a dollar an hour more than I am. That's great. I'm just going to work harder. It doesn't do that. And you know what? He's making a dollar more an hour so he can do more work. I'll sit back and do nothing. <laughs> and watch him work. <laughs> Deborah. Uh, the yeah, absolutely. The, the focus is a horizontal perspective. It's no longer a vertical perspective. No longer are we concerned about God and what he thinks. Our focus is instead on people and how they want to value and how they view things. Grant? Yeah, absolutely. Let me go on quickly because not only did they have an respect or, or had a, uh, a grumbling spirit, but they also had an improper perspective regarding the value of their own labor. They're very quick to point out all the sacrifices that they made. The Lord, in verse 12, we've borne the burden and the heat of the day. Lord, we've, we've Master, we, we've done all the work. We worked when it was hot outside. Sometimes we have a little bit of an overinflated view of our own labor. 
Um, almost as though, you know, Lord, if, <laughs> if it wasn't for me, then this ministry wouldn't have anything. It'd never get done if it wasn't for me. Well, pat yourself on the back. God's going to kick you in the rear end if you have that kind of an attitude. Uh, it's not right. He goes on. He answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. Did thou not agree with me for a penny? Did you agree to be paid these wages? Yes. Were you paid those wages? Yes. I've said to many individuals who are grumbling about the wage they are being paid, did you agree to it? Yeah. Yeah. Have you gotten it? Yes. Most of the time you've even gotten a little bit of a raise, haven't you? Yeah. So what's that say? You were the dummy who accepted it. Go get another job. Okay? You've been paid exactly what you agreed to be paid. Now, I would not just quit the job because, as many have learned, it's not as easy to find another job, and then you would be very thankful for the one that you used to have. But he goes on, and he says, take that, thy, that, or take that thine is, and go thy way. I'll come, I will give unto the last, even as unto thee, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil? Because I am good? You're looking at things from a wrong perspective. You have allowed an evil eye. Why? Because you have fallen into the pitfall of comparison. Recognize the danger of keeping score or keeping a record of everything that you've done. Lord, we've worked all day in the heat of the day. You be careful about keeping a record of, of the work that you've done. God does a pretty good job. My Bible is very clear in Matthew 6 that... And if you're doing things with this kind of a motive, you have your reward. And that's not much. It's whatever praise you get from man. And if, if, if that's what you're banking on in life, you are going to be sadly disappointed in life. Uh, you're, you're not going to hear a whole lot of that. You'll hear a whole lot of complaining and a whole lot of criticism. You're not going to hear a lot of thanks. But they kept a pretty good record of everything they had done. Well, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. What did they do? Nothing. We need to be very careful. We need to be very mindful, and, and I think that we find, uh, obviously, problems that, that come about. The master was perfectly right in what he did, even though it was not necessarily fair to these individuals. Be careful. Avoid the pitfall of comparison. I went on in my notes with the study of Elijah, 1 Kings 19. I'm not sure whether we'll go to that. It would certainly be another one that you could use to illustrate it because he says in that passage in 1 Kings 19, Lord, go ahead and kill me uh, because I am not better, key word, there's your comparison, than my father's. I'm not as good as they were, Lord, therefore I'm useless. Go ahead and kill me. It's another comparison. And they are so problematic to us. Avoid them at all costs. We need to pray and be dismissed.